as an audience beyond just people who look at TV. So I look at this immediately and I'm like, oh my gosh, how did that guy get 6.7 free for books? Because to me, as a uh, actually free. I, I know, I know. <laughs> um, and it, the same deal, somebody had a graphic and it was a baseball thing and whatever, HRs, and I was like, I cannot believe that guy played for 280 hours. You know, like it. Oh, I assumed that he worked for Human Resources. <laughs> <laughs> that turned out. Um, so, and that's something else I've been kind of re-familiarizing myself or just trying to familiarize myself at all with um, hockey analytics stuff, is that uh, one thing you always want to think about is the accessibility of your visualization to people who are new to the, new to the scene. Um, I think that one of the things that we underestimate is how easily frustrated humans are we're super easily frustrated. And um, whether or not when you hover over CF percent and it says what that stands for, or it doesn't, it can make a difference in terms of whether or not somebody can read your chart. What does CF percent stand for? Yeah, 44 percent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think, um, thank you guys. I wanna open up for questions, if anyone has a question, let me know. Raise your hand, we'll bring a mic up. Hey, so I'm uh, very interested in um, the, the real time, I guess, the uh, time domain charts of you know basketball players moving around or baseball players tracking their velocities. So. If you can talk about it, how has that data gotten? Do you, do you watch video feeds and try to estimate that, or do you have sensors on players? Or I guess how does that work? Um, well, for baseball, there is their new technology. The new technology that's come out, um, and literally, it's as of last season. So, 2015 was the first time that that the data are out there, and they are still any player tracking data is still proprietary. So um, you may see those lines, but it's only being released by MLB and they're not giving you enough information to do reasonable analysis. Um, the technology there, StatCast includes two things. One is something called TrackMan, which is actually tracking the ball off the bat. And um, the one Picasso that I showed you was a mistake on their part and they've never shown one since. They also can't track the throw which means I can tell people about that now because they put it up on Twitter. <laughs> so, at least I think so. But um, the other part uh, where you're seeing the players moving, the technology is something called Higo, which does in fact, and I'm not entirely sure how this works, it basically gets the center of mass on any given player. So you're not getting things like limbs or whatever, you're just getting where the player is roughly. I do not know what the uncertainty is on that, I would assume it's of the order of a few feet, but um, you know, it's not. You can't treat it as a point source. Um, so, does that answer your question so, for the baseball? So, so I guess where where is the data coming from? Is it a video or like? Um, it is visual, but you are getting stuff that is basically you know point coordinates. So, kind of think X Y T type stuff um, in n dimensions. So we're close. Oh, but, well, I mean, that is the, the source tech only gives you location stuff. You, you presumably can map it with video, and I'm sure there are teams that are doing it because you want to see how um, uh, you want to see how, for instance, how accurate. If, the, if you are discovering anomalies in your data, you obviously want to go back to video and see, okay, did that really happen, or is it that there's something wrong either with the tech or the way the software has been written such that it's being interpreted. And I know certainly with the pitch tracking, there are absolutely issues that they've discovered that come from the instrumentation itself and the fact that the uncertainty of the pointing within the instrumentation was not being taken into account. And now that it is, I think some teams are doing better. Yeah, so um, the easy answer is sport move. Uh, but, uh, Essentially, the technology in terms of not the movement is optical tracking data, um, as is the velocity. 
But then you get into uh, players' facial data that has things like categorizing uh, shots under pressure. And um, what's going on behind the scenes there, I'm not privy to all of it, but uh, a lot of it is semi-supervised machine learning. So you set up parameters uh, that kind of, sort of, make sense theoretically. Um, and then you have humans involved who, including people who just do analytics and actually look at what's being called what, and then they go back and look at the video when it's wrong. But in terms of machine learning, um, it's semi-supervised. So you have people who are correcting uh, play categorizations or state types and stuff like that. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I, yeah, I appreciate that. So I'm, I'm a machine learning person, so awesome. I'm interested. Yeah, there, there's you. definitely machine learning involved. Unfortunately, it's where all the sausage is made. So uh, we can't go into it really, either because they don't tell us or because we can't talk about it. <laughs> Uh, when you guys deliver visuals to your audience, how confident are you that the audience will say, I get it, and if they don't, um, do you just have a plan B, or is it like, all right, well, that's what I have? Uh, uh, depends sensitively on how much sleep I have. <laughs> <laughs> that, so, I mean, that, the, the really short version is that you can never be totally sure. You, you know, every time you, every time you try to tell anything to anybody, you never quite know if it's gonna get across. And one of the things that makes data visualization extremely appealing to me is that the communication that you send out does not always have to be of the form, here is a fact that I am going to tell you. It doesn't have to be, you know, did you hear about that thing that happened? It can be more like, you look at this. Just here is here is a space, here is a shape, here is a, uh, a depiction of something of mutual interest to us. You know, I think I've shown you some features that are interesting and you can read it more like a map. We don't, you know, you don't read a map and think, oh, that was thrilling. You know, you, the, you, like, it, it's a reference document, but it's not, you know, it, but it's a reference document in a, in a particular purpose in a particular sphere. So sometimes you feel very confident that the thing that you're putting in front of somebody is something which is of mutual interest to you and that person. And so in that sense, you can be very confident that you're going to get some of you know, you, especially for things where you, where, you know, sometimes you're, you're hitting people's intuitions that are extremely strong, that have been home since birth. Sometimes you're hitting people's intuitions that are, that are much weaker, that in, and you're not nearly so sure. And, and so you can, I think you just have to be, um, I mean, the backup line is always, for me at least, is always just to talk with people who want to talk. I think be ready to engage with people who are interested in engaging with you, and, you know, and be prepared to explain, and be prepared to say, you know, all the time people say, well, why did you do this like this? And they say, well, I did that to accommodate people who are colorblind. The fact that you're not colorblind is not relevant to the conversation, but it means I'm not going to change my database to please you. Because it's already been changed to these other people. And, and so, you know, if you can communicate those things in a way that's, that's kind, you know, that doesn't require blowing people off, then you find actually that, that you get a lot of give and take. And that's, and what Mary was saying a minute ago about people being frustrated is that the, it does happen extremely easily. And, and you need to have a willingness to work through that frustration. It's not the same, the same sort of thing when you, keep, you, know, you read a page of text three times and you don't get it, and eventually you just say, what the hell with this? You, know, you, you need to have some sort of, uh, I don't know if thick-skinned is the phrase, but, but some sort of willingness to engage that lets you get over that frustration. Uh, and, and a great deal of written documentation and accepting the fact that people learn in different ways. So I have, most of my visualizations, the complicated ones, have text explainers that just say what I would say to somebody if they ask me what's going on here. Some people don't like them, some people don't need them, but many people adore them, so. In, in my case, uh, I actually start, I mean, I, I, let's put it this way, I, I have a set of, I don't know if you call them collaborators, people where I can get feedback without violating NDAs, um, and they happen to be things like scouts and coaches or whatever, and I will come up with an idea, and sometimes it's just a pencil sketch because I don't want to go through and have to write the rings of code. Uh, and I'll go to them and I'll say, this is what I've got. I think I'm describing this. Am I actually describing this? And does it mean anything to you? And I get feedback and there's basically a feedback loop that goes through um, until both Keith, or always Keith, and I are comfortable with um, what's being produced at which point visualization and the technique is something that I'll then 
put out there. And so that's how you're getting things like the range map that I showed you. Um, and I can promise you I have other stuff out there that's been well received. Um, but that's about all. <laughs> So the, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I, so one of the reasons you won't see a lot of my work up here is my visualizations are never done. Um, but that doesn't mean that I never put them out there. One of the reasons I really like R and Python, I tend to use R more, but I think they're all great, is that you have this reproducible research pipeline, um, which is, it's not just about other people reproducing it, it's sometimes, you need to reproduce it. Um, and that reproduction might be because the style of data visualization you were using didn't really work for your audience, or some other people want to see it another way. Um, for me, I actually think that there's a huge benefit that, to that in terms of like human behavior. I think people are less defensive when they know, like, okay, cool, I, I'll. I'll visualize this with a different type of geometry, press play, same data, or you miss this data, run this analysis with that, fine. Pull it down, run it again. Um, and it, so I, I think that is a, a really, really great opportunity to kind of change the game in terms of the dialogue among analysts yeah, and non-analysts, but. I, I find that incredibly useful, incredibly useful avenue of communication is not so much talking to the fans specifically, but we're talking with other people and, and other people doing work like mine. And then you say, you know, I would do it this way. This is just like what you were saying, Mary, where you have this pipeline of people you can, this people you can talk to. And one other thing, another answer to your question about, um, about confidence in, in making sure your point gets across, one very handy tool is having a, an established visual grammar that you can that you can build up over time. The, the same kind of thing where, you know, if you're watching like a Wes Anderson film and you, you just sort of you know, you dump in the middle of nowhere, you've never heard of this film, but you watch for five minutes and you think, is this a Wes Anderson film? You can, you can sort of just tell. You say, oh, you know, this is, and, and so. Like the heat maps I just showed. You just know who, who made them. You can just sort of tell who's, or whose instincts inform them. You think, oh, this is a student of so-and-so, even if you know it's not so-and-so. They learned from, you know, they learned how to do heat maps from her. And, and those sorts of things, there's little details like, you know, using the same 30 colors for the same 30 teams when you make bar charts. Using the same, using the same, Visual elements using the same, you know, blue always for offense and red always for defense, or you know, whatever, like whatever conventions you've established, using them across a whole suite of, of things that you put out means that every tiny bit of effort that somebody puts into understanding one of your things, even if they don't like you, even if they walk away from that being annoyed, then they come back to seeing your stuff months later, and then it's a little bit easier, it goes over a little bit smoother because they did, because of the things that they picked up from you already and they changed your things all the time. I'm gonna Stop you guys for a moment. And um, we started a couple minutes later. I take a couple more questions. But um, do you currently think that sports commentators, specifically play-by-play -play and color commentary, but also other analysts, use the information that you guys give them effectively? And if not, how do you think they could do it more effectively? Can I start with this? Um, short answer: No. <laughs> Um, but I don't actually think that's the commentator's fault. Uh, if you actually speak to the broadcasters, this is where the dialogue comes in. It needs to start from the broadcasters. I've absolutely seen situations and talked to people where it, it's really obvious that they want numbers and visualizations that describe certain metric. You can ditch about that if you want later. Um, and it almost feels like, you know, Harold Reynolds or someone like that. Sorry, just if you know baseball, that's like a laugh line right there. Um, <laughs> is uh, that he's clearly reading a cue card that has some particular numerical analytic result and it means nothing to him and the only reason that he's saying it's because someone told him to. So it really, really needs to be improved. Yeah, you get, you get this sort of um, trivia effect that, that can really infiltrate broadcasting especially. And and I think, you know, of course, that's because the, the methodology there is, is, you know, a guy or a pair of guys in a truck with a computer coming up with little tidbits and they have to be kept extremely small because they have to be internalized by a man doing his job, you know, by talking into a microphone. The, and and you, need, you need a whole pipeline which is connected better where, where you can, and, and Meredith is exactly right, that it has to come from the broadcasters themselves.
themselves. You know, the question you want to answer is, what kinds of information do you want at your fingertips when you're broadcasting? And that phrase, at your fingertips, is, is a code word that means visualize. Uh, you know, you take all this information and you put it in a graphic, and now all of a sudden you do have something that you can internalize, you know, immediately. And, and oftentimes, those are graphics that might not ever see.